I would like now to turn to the last presentation, uh, which is by Narendra Pachkede, who is based in Toronto, London, and Geneva. He has always been a person of multiple cities, and his title of this, his, his talk is actually Circus of Imaginations. And Narendra is, is, a, is a Commonwealth fellow who's been uh, both an artist and a curator and a programmer for a very long time. But he's known predominantly as a critique and a writer because he does contribute um, all his activities um, as a discourse orientated. Um, there is a very strong relationship in his exhibition making to pedagogy and he always fosters collaborations and interventions whenever possible, um, not only with, with human beings, uh, but with sites, with events, with histories and networks. Uh, Narendra is, has an incredible knowledge and is connected so well to so many different histories that he cannot but act as a sort of realm of comparison or comparative um, anthropologies. Uh, and I'm very grateful for that because I often turn to Narendra uh, when I am looking for a source or a way to endorse what I'm thinking through other ways. So here we are again, Narendra, please do take the, 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 the seat and, and let us know about the circuits of imaginations. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shaheen, for your kindness and kind words and to Barbara, her colleagues and the team supporting this endeavor. Thank you so much. Uh, if I may be uh, get the sharing thing. We can see it now. Perfect. Do you get it? Yes, okay. we can. Super. What I'm going to do today is basically, uh, I, I enjoy it first and foremost. I really enjoy it. Uh, my co-panelists uh, and their, 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 uh, their presentations and their thoughts. Uh, I love, uh, I've done a lot of work on uh, uh, Indonesian, uh, multiple aspects of it, Wayang onwards, uh, and uh, it is it is really uh, the whole I world of shadow puppetry to the contemporary forms uh, is something which is uh, quite uh, fascinating. So I was almost like I was lost in that world for a moment, and I'm glad you woke me up in a way. And uh, but I will continue with the same sense of spirit, so to say, with the idea of play as we speak today. Uh, and my idea of play basically is in terms of as a modality of exploration. Uh, and in when we invoke the notion of play, there is a moment, not only about your, I'm not just suggesting any cognitive movement per se, but also a movement of ideas, movement of body, uh, and how it all comes together. And uh, and I think we have lost the ability, if not lost, then at least we have uh, we have faded, uh, or, or rather we have faded in our ability to play, so to say. Uh, and what I'm going to do today is just uh, play with some set of ideas, possibly throw them at you, and make some connections, uh, and definitely not in a didactic sense. I'm not uh, speak uh, like I'm not going to give a lecture per se. Uh, but what I'm going to do is speak on three uh, thematics. Uh, one, uh, the idea of walking. Second, of course, the notion of uh, body movement. And third, the idea of dance itself. Uh, from a very particular perspective, of course. Uh, and something that I have, these are the three things, uh, three thematics, broadly speaking, in the context of today's um, gathering. Uh, I've been in, I have been in a way engaged with it for a period of time. I'm not a dancer. I'm not a choreographer. I'm not a theorist of dance at the same time. Yet I write on dance. Uh, I produce productions, so to say, big ones. Uh, 
uh, I curate uh, things related to dance also, if I may kind of just keep uh, the focus on the idea of movement and dance for this panel's sake. And, uh, and that is where I would like to kind of uh, uh, speak to these three elements and then kind of uh, touch to the, some of my recently uh, curated uh, show on Bhangra, uh, which is the Punjabi dance, which is very boisterous. There's no opacity. It is loud. It is in your face. And uh, so it is an interesting contrast in, a, in the sense to what uh, Wania was talking about. At, at the same time, uh, uh, when I look at the notion of the first thing that I would like to invoke, the idea of walking, I want to basically again connect with what Vanya actually said uh, and was wondering, uh, as she was speaking about, is walking or does walking offer any form of opacity? And uh, I've been thinking about it, perhaps we will get into the conversation uh, later to really discuss on that part. But walking has moved into increasingly visible, um, like increasingly vis uh, visible kind of pursuits in, uh, in social, cultural, geographical studies, um, as well as art and cultural practices in recent times. And uh, walking practices are often mobilized as a means of sensing and learning about spaces, for instance, um, for enabling reflection on the mutual constitution of bodies and landscape, and for finding uh, kind of meaning within and potentially re-enchanting environments. So the idea of uh, the idea that walking enunciates spaces and is creative, elusive, re resistive to everyday practice is wonderfully kind of in a way counterpoise to these multiple or a, a particular sense of uh, like how, how, how it gets or retains a certain kind of a common place, you know. And uh, one of the uh, one of the key element that I would like to uh, talk about uh, is how one could consider through walking in is one's engagement with the politics of, uh, for instance, urban space, uh, or questioning the idea of state. Attention is paid to walking as the method of unfolding stories. Also, so walking could be a storytelling device. And to its potential to unsettle and bring into question current realities, especially in the context of regulated, fortified, surveilled zones of neoliberal cities. The openness and ambivalence of these practices, here I am referring to walking, suggests a need for a more nuanced approach to multiple rhythms trajectories, and narratives that constitute a range of spaces, including urban, as well as their contested invisibilities. And beyond walking as a political performance, it also involves hospitality, friendship, nostalgia, gifts, and more importantly, forgiveness. So these are very loaded, uh, not just normative terms, but also culturally endowed practices as almost like in the form of rituals. And so walking as a political act for me enables us to define our agency. And artists have never shied away from taking a closer look uh, to the very idea of uh, walking. And maybe with those kind of uh, thoughts that preface this idea of walking, I would like to show you a short video which was done by a, one of the most amazing uh, animator, Canadian animator named Ryan Larkins in 1968. And his animation was uh, uh, shortlisted for Oscars. 
it, 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 it didn't get it for many reasons. So we'll speak about it later. But here's this video, and uh, it's just a short video. Uh, enjoy it. from Ryan's 
walking, I want to take you straight to Rory, another chap, uh, Rory Stewart. And uh, he did a two year solo walk across North Central Afghanistan in 2002, after the 9-11. Uh, he's, a, he's a fascinating guy. I, 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 I like him uh, for many reasons, not everything that I agree with him. A uh, British politician, of, uh, he was a diplomat, he resigned and he just went across this uh, solo walk for two years. Uh, and uh, you should check his book, uh, this particular book and uh, see on uh, and and the and how he I mean it was his walk was a kind of a critique of the the position that was taken uh, and uh, he he kind of uh, devotes himself to that particular cause in in the subsequent years uh, with his activities in Afghanistan etc etc but I just wanted to use it as an illustration here. I will speak to you about the other kinds of walks that we have seen. For instance, uh, the whole uh, walk, like when Rory went all the way to, uh, like Rory's narrative could be in a way very orientalizing, going to a, you know the white savior kind of notion complex. And here we see the flow in the river's direction, the refugees walking into the very heart of Europe, so to say. And uh, likewise, and this is not something new, And but I have always been very fascinated by walks and walking itself, uh, though my body doesn't show that I do walk that much, but I do manage to walk sometimes. Uh, similarly, look at these other walks that I would uh, like to share with you, some of these, the Selma one, uh, the women's war march that happened uh, after Trump's uh, uh, election in 2017 and the recent walk of uh, one of the Indian uh, political leader uh, who walked about 2,000 miles from down south of uh, southern southernmost point of uh, India to all the way to the northernmost uh, the, and it it galvanized uh, the entire society in a whole different way so walks are very very fascinating uh, elements that I find myself engaged with. Uh, and let me take you to another idea of walk, which uh, I was trying to uh, interestingly uh, focus upon because this was a moment where after Rwanda crisis uh, and after that entire violence, uh, the, the West uh, invariably uh, came in its imperial gear to offer uh, tons of millions of dollars to the African, especially East African museums, and trying to tell them how you should deal with violence, et cetera, et cetera. And there was this one very important curator who, his name is Sultan Somji. Uh, he was a curator at the National Kenyan Museum, uh, very senior guy, very important figure. And he talks about the peace walks and which is about the staffs being peace staffs being exchanged, et cetera. And I've just put some images here and you see how the members of indigenous communities and how they, they come together in this entire kind of a critique or uh, in a way saying no to the Western interests post Rwanda, what is exactly happening there. And I would strongly urge you to, if possible to uh, read uh, and I, I mean, here here's the book uh, it's a thick book it's uh, and this is the he, Sultan Somji is he talks about uh, this entire process about these peace walks and uh, he's an important guy he he's a laureate of uh, the un, the unsung hero which is provided which is awarded by uh, UNESCO and uh, and with these walks, let me go on to another modality of movement, and that I would talk about parkour. Now, I am not going to get into the its history per se, uh, but I'm just bringing it here more as an illustrative a point to help and understand how movement of the body is used in negotiating and defying spaces. And in case of parkour, especially the urban spaces, 
uh, we know urban planning, uh, planning of cities is never neutral. Uh, it's not a neutral act and it manifests in, uh, and that in, you, you see this manifesting in issues of accessibility, disadvantages uh, in terms of accessing uh, amenities, uh, ex um, impacting on your human rights, et cetera, et cetera. And how the underprivileged and discriminated youth, uh, largely the blacks in the suburbs of Paris emerge with this particular practice of moving the body through space uh, more as a, a challenge and th this is a this was uh, in a way a cultural challenge just the way in china and uh, india or largely asia when you look at uh, they came up with a miscalled language so these are all cultural responses to technologies and all so parkour was a very interesting response to this uh, cultural response to the technology of city planning and uh, and l let me be very clear like the capital and the capitalists they never let go any opportunity so today uh, uh, the idea of parkour is almost in the has been rebranded as the idea of uh, lifestyle uh, and the notion of free running is being talked about uh, and and I'll show a short video, and that video will actually let you know, uh, give you a very clearer understanding of how the capitalists co-opt these resisting mechanisms. And it is true even with the Black Lives Matter, or you name any of the resistance, it's a very standard practice because it offers them uh, a great avenue, you know, not just to make profits, but it is a scale that is given an exposure with that issues, those issues. So let me show you a little uh, one of the one of the one of the founders because there's a complex and contested history. So I'll play you a short video to talk about this. The world is our playground. Each time I look at the city, you will start to, to see how functional it can be. You see line, you see a lot of uh, routes. I think after, can I do this path? My name is Sébastien Foucault. I'm the pioneer of parkour and free running. Free running is a way of expressing yourself in your environment with no limitation. It's swinging, uh, balance, jumping, uh, um, flipping, tripping. Uh, everything you feel uh, when you feel freedom. I would say as a ultimate athlete, training is considered as a sport for a certain person, as an art form for other people. Wherever you've got obstacle, wherever you've got uh, a place when you can express yourself as a human being, you can do training. I was born in France, in the suburb of Paris. I started in the late eighties with my with my friend uh, David Bell and uh, other people, other friends. For me, it was a a child play. Michael Jordan was uh, really the, the inspiration for me. Make you feel like you can fly. His way of moving is so graceful. The French word for what we're doing is parkour, which is the uh, way with obstacles. Parkour at the beginning uh, was quite very uh, one dimensional. It was really like. A to B, we shouldn't do this, we shouldn't do that. Which for me, as an artist, I really feel I want to express myself. I don't want to have any limitation. And I evolved from uh, parkour to free running. It's more my way. When I do free running, I feel free. I feel uh, in connection with my body and with my environment. I started with parkour in 1989, and uh, I founded free running in 2003. We're using stairs, railing, walls, trees, uh, ramps, everything. In 2006, I was a Bond villain in Casino Royale. It was like fantastic, working on big stage, uh, fighting James Bond, um, helicopter shots, everything. For the discipline, I think it was a big, um, a big platform. Uh, it was, uh, I think it just made the discipline uh, bigger and bigger. Clinic parkour is a very risky uh, discipline. You have to be really focused on what you're going to do. 
you need to pay attention on, your, on the entire environment. And that's what you're thinking about before you do uh, a single move. But you need to have a lot of dedication, a lot of practice to, to get there. For me, it's a lifestyle. There is no beginning, middle, and end. It's part of my life. It would be forever. I practice this forever until I die. Uh, and that brings me to the third element, dance, in a way to um, to invoke a very obvious question. As I, as right at the outset, I said I'm, I'm not a dancer or a choreographer per se, or, but I do write on it. Uh, I do uh, curate, uh, etc. And uh, but always, what I have been thinking about is like what happens when you strip it down to its bare bone notion of movement or a gesture per se. And I grapple with these questions of movement and its place in our sort of social, so to say, aligned with the questions of uh, like, you know, dance scholar uh, Naomi Solman, uh, like what does it mean to move uh, or to be moved? Uh, who is afforded movement uh, or who isn't? Uh, what body of force to move others kept still? Uh, you know, very bare, uh, uh, trying to go to the core of this idea of movement itself and how does movement intersect with the issues of labor, visibility. And these are, again, not new questions, but ones that contemporary dancers have engaged with also. And as in our illusion, illusion rather to the ephemerality of dance, she does ask, what is, what is it that dance produces in time. And that has always rested with me in terms of a kind of a very interesting operative question and which uh, kind of brought me to this notion of uh, one of the very interesting dancer who passed away recently and his name was Astad Debu. Uh, and I have written on him and I have spoken uh, had had uh, collaborated with him on a couple of projects. And here, um, on the one on the right is where he is performing at a 15th century site. Uh, it is a city, it is a decadent city, leftover relic of a beautiful city uh, by name Chapa Nair. And we had a project of getting it onto a UNESCO heritage status site. And um, so he had come and he performed on the ramparts of the wall. And it was a beautiful, um, uh, it was a very beautiful moment. Uh, but he, he was, it was a very interesting point at that time when precisely how does dance and time interact this, this site and his form of dance. And that was something which was very, uh, very very exciting for me. Uh, the introduction, like he, for him, the int the introduction to dance came from uh, after seeing uh, Marie Louis Dance Company in U.S. Um, uh, of U.S. performing in Mumbai uh, when he was just a 19 year old uh, a student of economics per se. And as he said to me, uh, like it was the freedom to use the body in an entirely different manner. The experience of seeing. Uh, the position, the ex rather the exposition of a newly found body language in space is something that kind of defined it. And that precisely is the kind of a title of the piece uh, as, uh, in a feature interview that I did with him. And he said to me that despite uh, so many various other modern movements, uh, here, it was imperative to be to have a strong foundation for a good technique in the sense that you need to be rooted, anchored in classical traditions. And uh, Astad was rooted in uh, the idea of Kathakali, uh, the practice of Kathakali. And that brings me to the next slide, which is uh, I produce something called Othello in Kathakali trying to bring a 17th century text and a 17th century dance form together. And it was quite a complex, uh, like 
quite a complex process, but we were very successful. I won't get much into it right now, uh, but I will, because I'll be obsessed to talk and endlessly about it. It was a very fulfilling uh, production, uh, which I did in uh, Baroda in the mid nineties in Gujarat. And given this uh, varied understanding and kind of engagement with, uh, with the notion of dance, I, when I was invited uh, by the Portrait Gallery of Canada to, to curate uh, Gurdi Pander, and some of you might have come across him. Uh, he's another uh, solitary Bhangra dancer on YouTube. He's, he's like a YouTube celebrity. And I, I was wondering uh, like how best one could curate uh, someone like uh, Gurdeep and his practice of Bhangra. And uh, like the challenge was basically how to excavate him and his practice of dance from the registers of diversity and ethnicity, which are a very obvious conditions uh, which are given and to take it away and bring it back as the, from the perspective of just notion of movements and how, what it does uh, in terms of body, space, time, uh, spirit. And th those were my kind of concerns. And uh, it was very interesting because the portrait gallery at the same time is a uh, is a very uh, interesting it's an emerging social memory institution uh, that intends to kind of vigorously engage with the questions of inequality and misrepresentation that portraiture and portrait collections raise uh, and as well as the fundamental challenges to traditional museology that the digital age presents so it it uh, I was lucky in that sense that here was a platform, institutional platform, and to bring in uh, a very traditional old uh, cultural practice, a cultural dance practice, uh, which is largely a collective practice as against an individual. And what were the tensions there between that to be brought here onto this platform of this institution and to document uh, and allow me to document the, whether portraying or portrayed or both for their own sake, on their own terms, as well as in their own voices. So it was a very free space to play with and which I would like to really uh, like kind of, uh, I, I really enjoyed doing that. And I, I felt uh, quite uh, uh, redeemed in a way of my understanding of dance and the understanding of movement and its place in the social. And as this, as the institution vision goes about, like which enabled me to curate this show, it did play with this notion of how do we engage with these contested histories and experiences primarily, and uh, which, which allowed for that authentic portrayal of a particular practice. And that, that kind of makes me, uh, made me look at how should I, how best would be the way to look at uh, Gurdeep's work. And this is, uh, this is a brief statement that I put on. So I collected much of his material, which was there. I had interviews with him and all his video material. And I looked at his material more as a found material. And as a found material, then I played with it and kind of ripped it off in different ways and reorganized it uh, to offer a particular um, kind of uh, a feel to it uh, uh, in a very non-Bhangra or in a conventional understanding of Bhangra uh, uh, as a dance form. And um, I would strongly advise you to go on to that link or just put that name Gurdeep Pandir and uh, have a have an experience for yourself because it is there's layers of it. There's poetry, there's music, there's dance. And so it will give you a, a layered experience of that entire thing. And uh, here's a little screenshot which just gives you a notion of how the videos are moving and what is exactly happening in terms of this solitary body doing a particular kind of a 
folk dance or just simple set of movements depends it is open to interpretations and as it kind of inter inter intercuts with poetry uh, at the same time and so this is something which i would uh, strongly urge you to kind of have a look at it and use that hashtag of bhangra and me and try to um, express what it really means to you or what your experience has been uh, vis -vis after you see the uh, after you see the uh, the show online but the most important thing is how does one conceptualize this play of ideas in terms of all these dance movement etc that we talked about and the, the what i like I mean, there's a kind of um, uh, there's a schema that one need to understand like there is uh, with which i play often uh, and the, on these two axes that we see the idea of movement and displacement and mobile and rootedness and uh, this offers me a schema to place a moving body per se and try to understand these uh, connections uh, like for instance if i may pose a question is tourism what is the idea of being a tourist or tourism or tourist oriented travel etc where does it really fit in uh, in that sense of the movement of a body per se uh, and that is this is the schema and i will speak about if there is a question we can get to it but this is one thing that when you look at dance walking parkour they they can be easily uh, plotted onto the schema to foreground certain tensions. And the tensions that I'm talking about is this, the tension which are lived every day between imagination and memory. And it is not just a sociocultural memory, but it is also the memory of the body uh, from muscle body, muscle memory onwards. So uh, this is something which I like to spend some time on uh, because it's a critical part and as, Arjuna Padarai famously said it, like how he phrased it actually, imagination is a social practice and that enables performing alternatives. And artists do play a principal role in the ability of society to inaugurate new forms of itself, as well as to rehearse alternate ways of being, offering perspectives and experiences that counter and exceed dominant social and cultural forms. And as Barbara Adams Wright, quote, in creating material objects such as stories, songs, public spaces, artworks, even policies and scientific experiments, memes and social events, we produce not just the artifacts of themselves, but also the undeniable recognition that we share a world in common. In materializing, the world, artists, poets, historiographers, monument builders, writers, any other creative practitioner, including all of us, provide a home where we can gather to create a world and build a future. And this sense of public square, you know, you can find in the library, you know, on a table, the museum, the sidewalk, the garden, the neighborhood. They all provide the space where people can convene, collaborate, and create the worlds in which they would like to live, end quote. As we move in our everyday life, the tension that we experience is this tension that you see here, one between imagination and memory. And we have to realize the fact that ours is a hermeneutical undertaking. Our inquiry should be located in this tension, or rather is located, I would argue. Question like, how do we care for memory via aesthetic means? Now, we can see in that sense how art is the hermeneutical space of a nation. And it has put a question mark, it allows us rather to put a question mark in front of recited truths that we take for granted uh, or society's uh, function, 
how societies function mimicking each other with a template of consensus. As Salman Rushdie says in his recent book, a uh, book of essays, Languages of Truth, quote, the breakdown in the old agreements about reality is now the most significant reality. Reality is not just simply something given. I would say it is an argument and always has been, unquote. What he's alluding here is to the fact that consensus-based argument about reality is particularly worrisome, populated by propaganda and misinformation. We are seeing this in the growing rise of populism across the world and the many claims to reality. So the question we have to ask here is, where does art fit into this? And this is very critical for us. Like Vanya, for instance, in the earlier part of the panel discussion, presentation rather, she spoke about the notion of universality and how universality is used as a garb, so to say, to hide or to play with certain or to create certain orders for instance, or even simply an act of othering at the same time. So I think th this is what that idea of reality is being here alluded to at the same time. And so what something that I mentioned in my early part, as well as in my uh, exhibition, the Bhangra and me, the question is, what does it mean to be us in the contemporary condition of our lives and its memory? Since we are living in a very ocular regime, you know, it's all visual, how do we talk of the moment, the body? Is it still through the eyes or through what are the senses? And I think, uh, how do we account for the moment? That's what I'm trying to arrive at and not necessarily it's visuality. And I think that's a broader kind of a question. And, but to do that, do we have a capacity to imagine, to imagine that new future in the larger sense or the larger context of the emergence of the know-all society in which the triumph of the algorithmic know-how, of course, of which we are all beneficiary implies that all aspects of our lives activities have become part of a set of procedural and programmed actions, not to deny the accomplishments, but rather to say how our engagement of minds and lives in shaping the world should proceed. So there is a kind of a template already given to us. Central to our enterprise today then is how to rethink the idea of reason, truth, doing, thought, and being. The answers are pegged on our capacity to imagine. Are we allowed to imagine? Can we build our capacities to imagine? Do we have sites for imagination? Now, one can trace uh, these questions, like what we can trace it to the central constituent, constitutive tensions of modernity, that between reason and imagination, which offers competing visions of, or versions of uh, reality. And that is where we start playing with this, uh, we need to, uh, confront these fundamental questions, such as whether there is distinction between the perceived and the imagined, the relationship between imagination and creativity, the role of body in perception and imagination. While in, inquiry, in our inquiry, we are drawn more by the role of imaginary plays in the formation of the self and the social world. Now, there's a huge literature, there's enough to talk just on the idea of imaginary, the social imaginary, and uh, how it controls us or how it gets constituted. I will not get into it. If there is a question here and there, we can get into it. But uh, whether you are looking at Paul Rucker or Cornelius or Charles Taylor's work, principally, these are some of the key works which are getting into this notion of uh, understanding the relationship between our social imaginary in itself and the work of uh, imagination. So maybe on that note, I will try to uh, uh, say thank you for listening. And uh, because you must be tired by now, three <laughs> talks, and uh, we can open it 
for uh, some conversation Q and A, and uh, please uh, hashtag Bangra and me and try to check the show. Thank you so much. <laughs>